Welcome to XYPN Radio, where your host, Alan Moore, brings you into a community of fee-only financial planners who want to profitably and successfully serve Gen X and Gen Y clients. If you're ready to get the knowledge you need from leaders in your field, learn from forward-thinking advisors, and take action on your own goals, XYPN Radio is the show for you. Here's your host. Hello, and welcome to this episode of XYPN Radio. I am your host, Alan Moore, and I want to thank you so much for joining me today. Today's episode is an interview with J.D. Bruce who is the president of Abacus Wealth Partners, a firm based out of Santa Monica that manages a little over $1.2 billion. Now, you might recognize their name as they're actually the firm that bought my RIA, Serenity Financial Consulting, back in 2015. Now, Abacus is very unique because they are championing the concept that large firms can serve lower asset clients in a profitable way. So this interview goes through how Abacus made the switch from being the traditional 1% AUM with million-dollar minimums type firm and how all the different iterations that they've tried and the model they've ultimately settled on. We also talked about how they've incorporated monthly retainers into their firm and more. So for anyone that out there that owns or works in a larger firm, this episode is definitely for you. Also, JD waits until the very end of the show to drop a knowledge bomb that you are definitely going to want to hear, where he basically outlines a low-risk way for firm owners and younger advisors to jointly roll out a model to serve smaller and or younger clients within the existing firm. So definitely stay till the end to hear his recommendations. As always, you can access the show notes and additional resources at xyplanningnetwork.com slash 32. And also remember to join our VIP community at xyplanningnetwork.com slash VIP. This month's shows are brought to you by Wealthbox CRM, a technology partner of the XY Planning Network. Designed for financial advisors, Wealthbox is simple, beautiful, and a collaborative CRM. As their tagline says, Wealthbox is a CRM you'll actually enjoy. Start a free trial in 30 seconds at Wealthbox.com, and also be sure to check out our interview with founders of Wealthbox CRM, John Rourke and Dan Ferranti. All right, here's my interview with J.D. Bruce. Hey, hey, J.D., welcome to the show, ma'am. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate you You wanting to share my thoughts to everyone. Yeah, this is exciting because I'm very thrilled to have you on because this is a topic, I guess, that a lot of firms are wrestling with, and that is how are we going to basically change how we've been operating? How do we move away from strict AUM model in order to try to reach a different generation of client and really just a different clientele in general that just may not have saved enough money to meet the minimum AUM numbers? And and that's definitely something your firm is pioneering, which uh, you know is exciting. Uh, so I guess to kick it off, just give us a little brief background on Abacus and kind of what where the firm came from and what makes you know Abacus Wealth Partners unique in the planning space. Sure. I and mean, we've been around a long time in, in various incarnations, I think over 25 years at this point. And part of our mission it really from the beginning has been to really expand the number of people that we could help. Going back all the way, both of our founders are, are Buddhist and, and part of the, what they want to do is reduce suffering. And they saw a lot of suffering around financial matters. And they've both written books at this point about people's relationship to money. And the firm itself is really here to reduce that suffering. And when it comes down to, to really what makes us different, I kind of laughed when you asked that because we actually have our, on our one page business plan we share with all the employees, one of our sections is how we are different. And there's three things on there. And, and we really focus on those three things as the points where we differ from almost most of the industry, I suppose. The first is that we aim to use investments that improve lives without sacrificing returns. So that's kind of the classic socially responsible investing or impact investing. But our philosophy around that is to really match people's values to their investments in a way that doesn't take away from the investments themselves. And I think we have some great innovative ways of of doing that, although that's not what we're talking about today. The second piece is the other piece we're not talking about today, which is that for us, building wealth isn't nearly as important as improving a client's life. And whether that's reducing stress, whether it's helping them meet their goals, it's the wealth itself is, is really not important. And frequently we're talking our clients down from, from lofty visions of being in the, the top 1%. We're saying, well, do you really need that? And that's another big piece of, of who we are. But the last piece, number three on my list here, 
uh, is the one that, that really affects our conversation today, and that is that we aim to help everyone, even if they have no investments. That for us, uh, we are here to help people in their financial lives, not just manage investments. And because of that, in 2009, we decided to remove all our minimums and start offering financial planning for some kind of fee. And in 2009, we thought, great, we'll get this ready in six months and it'll be launched. And we finally rolled it out in 2014. <laughs> Funny how these things take a little longer when you're with a large firm because Abacus has how much under management? Uh, it's north of $1 billion, I think it's somewhere around $1.4 at this point. Okay, with a handful of clients. Uh, yeah, only in the twelve to 1400 somewhere around <laughs> there. So it took four, well, so five years, really, I guess four and a half, if you rolled it out in the spring of 14, to go from concept to actually launching this within the firm. And I would say that in terms of launch, we've had a soft launch for the last two years. We have far more clients who don't pay a retainer fee than do. Makes sense. Um, and it's only this year in 2016 that we're aiming to, to really take you know, a good percentage of our investment only clients and convert those into planning clients and ultimately really help them improve their lives even more than we have with just their investment portfolios. You know, it's one of the interesting things that when XY Planning Network launched, we knew there was a desire in the industry as a whole to serve younger clients and to serve clients that didn't have assets. And what we expected was, you know, there'd be some people that wanted to start a firm, some larger firms. And as most listeners probably know, we got flooded. I mean, we basically ended up becoming a launch pad for so many firms because there were either so few larger firms willing to really have the conversation or it just takes so freaking long to get things done when you have 1400 clients as opposed to when you have zero that a lot of folks just threw up their hands and said, hey, I'll just break away, go start my own firm. Well, now kind of two years, almost two years into XY Planning Network being in existence, we're starting to see more firms that have been having this conversation for a year, year and a half, two years. And now they're kind of getting to the point where we're saying, okay, this is something we want to do. We're seeing firms like Abacus do it profitably. Can you show us how? And, and obviously that's, that's what today's episode is about. I do want to circle back to one thing that you said, and that was that, you know, one of the, the three tenets is that you want to be able to help everyone. And I think that resonates with a lot of financial planners because ultimately I think many of us, if not most of us, especially on the fee only side, got into financial planning to help people. And what many people discover, especially if you're young and coming out of one of the degree programs or, or CFP certificate programs into the industry, you realize we don't help all people, that we really help a very select few people. And I mm -hmm. think it's always been this weird rub that like we want to help people and sometimes we just do it for free, but we don't know how to do it. And Abacus is championing a way to do this in a way that's actually profitable, that you can run a business. You're not running a charity. Yeah, I think that's really important. And, you know, we say we aim to help everyone. And I think the aim is the key word there. And it's where a lot of people get confused. And when we say we're willing to help anyone, they still have to pay our fee. And our fee isn't cheap, right? We're not right. saying come in for 20 bucks a month and we'll help you out. I and mean, we have a high touch service for these clients. It's costly. And, and it's costly to the tune of, a, of an expensive gym membership, a CrossFit or a, a luxury gym. And not everyone can afford that. And depending on where you live, that may mean that we're really only able to help people with, you know, $100,000, $150,000 of household income. Because if they're making thirty grand a year and are deeply in debt, they can't really afford us. Now, we have a pro bono program to help those people too, but that only scales so much. And um, you can only help so many people for free. Yeah. And of course, they've got to be a good fit for the firm, right? I mean, your firm has a very unique culture. And so the, the clients are going to be very attracted to it. It's uh, or they're not. And it's the beauty of having a very focused niche. Listeners, you know, are, are used to me saying the word niche every single episode because we just <laughs> keep harping on you've got to have a focus because, like I said, you're not literally trying to help every single American. You're trying to help everyone that you can. And that makes sense for your firm. Yeah. And in particular, there's a there's a very underserved population that really need help. And you have a lot of people with assets and some of those people are do-it-yourselfers and they do fine. And some of those people are working with investment advisors and there's, there's someone for everyone on the investment advisor side at this point. If you have even a small amount of assets, you can get someone to help you with that mm -hmm. for a reasonable fee if you know where to look. And then you have people with a lot of assets who get financial planning 
And the people who aren't really well served are the people with few assets who can't do it themselves because they don't understand and it's just not their skill set or personality. But they really need coaching and accountability and planning uh, in order to succeed. You know, the people with a, a relatively good income, and that may be that they're just starting out, or it may be that they're far off in their career and have just been making bad decisions for a long time. And, it, you know, it ultimately, as you know, it doesn't matter how much your income is, it's the net. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we have plenty of clients who come in here and they say, wow, I'd love to hire you, but I, no one will work with me because they don't have any assets. And we say, well, how much do you make a year? And they say, well, I make about $1.2 million a year. And we're like, no one's going to help you? And you make $1.2 million a year? Like, yeah, I just can't afford to, to pay anybody. We're like, why not? Like, <laughs> $1. $1.5 million a year. It's a, a really common story. Well, and you're based in Santa Monica, you know, just outside of LA, which I think has some of the, probably the highest earning poor people that you'll find in the US. So uh, mm -hmm. uh, I imagine a, a common issue. So pre-2009, run us through what was your fee structure and how did you work with clients? And you, you mentioned being investment only versus planning. So how did all of that work pre, you know, kind of conceptualizing this new model? Sure. So back in 2003, our firm was kind of or the modern incarnation of our firm was created through a merger with our two founders. And when they did that, they said, you know, we should be a, you know, the standard kind of conventional wisdom. Let's be a boutique wealth management firm that focuses on the high net worth and, and really raise our minimums. And so they said, good, we're going to put in a one to $2 million minimum and we're going to get rid of all of these small clients. And one of the founders had, had mostly done that on his own before the merger but the other founder didn't. And so he had all these clients that essentially had to go. And he sold a few of them off, and that felt really bad. And then he, he just let a few of them go, and that felt really bad. And he said, I'm not doing any more. This is it. Like, I'm keeping the rest. So we got to figure out a solution. And the solution was we created a whole separate firm kind of within our firm. It was actually two separate entities at the time, but it was uh, separately named, separately branded with a very low investment minimum that offered investments but no planning. It was essentially the uh, robo-advisor before there were robo-advisors. The technology wasn't there, so we did it all manually, cobbling together the, the pieces of the technology. And that is a really easy startup business for the first kind of 20 or 30 million or so. And then you realize once you get to about 30 million that you need infrastructure and you don't have any revenue. And so then you start reinvesting, you know, triple what your profits are, and it costs you a bunch of money for five years, but then it ultimately becomes a great business. And I think it's, a, you know, your, the XY Planning Network members tend to be startups, so they start dealing with these small clients, and they say, wow, this is actually pretty easy. And then I think, you know, the firms who try and do that get stuck because they realize that in order to do it at scale, it, it, it's expensive. Sure. And so we did that and we lowered our minimums over time from kind of 2003 to 2007. Uh, we started, I think, 100,000 minimum. We went down to 75, then down to 50 over the years. And our mission was really to how low can we get this minimum? And, you know, at this point, the robo-advisors have come in and they've fixed that problem with technology, right? They can get these minimums down really, really low. And what we realized is as we were starting that process, because this was always a mission to help these people. And we figured, we gave them a little bit of planning. You know, they got, they had an advisor. Uh, they got to meet their advisor. And it, so it was kind of more service than a robo-advisor, but less than you'd get from a comprehensive planner. And that became about, in terms of client headcount, ultimately about three quarters of our firm uh, in terms of client headcount. We had a huge number of these clients that, that weren't really getting proactive financial planning, right? We would answer their questions when they called, but we wouldn't call them. And we said, no, that's got to that's gotta change. And so in 2009, we, we merged the, the two firms together because there are some problems with having these kind of two separate firms with two separate advisory uh, populations. Mm -hmm. And so we decided to merge everything together into one firm, but two service levels. And now we've kind of come to the place where we're eliminating the service levels and really treating every client as a custom client. 
So this will be really fun because Michael Kitsis and I are going to co-host an episode here coming up in the next few weeks after this episode goes live all about what we call firm within a firm concept, which is exactly what you're talking about. Maybe not necessarily with a completely separate legal entity, but basically this concept. And I think this is where most advisors start whenever they're thinking inside of this large firm concept. How are we going to serve smaller clients? They go, well, why don't we, you know, maybe even a separate brand, separate service model We'll have a team dedicated to working with these younger clients or smaller clients, I should say, and they'll just kind of do their thing and they'll have their own P&L and, and all of that. Whereas what you're advocating for and really what Abacus has built is a, you're, I mean, by eliminating even service models, I mean, you're essentially saying you have a single service model with a fee structure that makes sense if you have zero in assets versus if you have 10 million in assets, it works. Is, is that fair? Yeah, I would say that what we've created and are are starting to roll out now is essentially a a custom service model where everyone's service is a little bit modularized, that each thing we do is very systematized in the same way every time. But what we do for each individual client is very different. And I think every planner would resonate with that. And that's really how most people work. Obviously, some people need some heavy advanced estate planning and some people don't. Some people not need a lot of work on insurance and some people don't. Some people have complex real estate, some people don't. And so you're only doing the work for each client that you're doing. The key with when you have these really disparate clients, the problem is pricing. It's not service. Service is easy because you're going to do the amount of service that the client needs. The problem is figuring out how to price what you're doing for that client. And that's been the thing that's been tricky for us for years. So I want to dig more into service model, but I, w- I want to highlight something that you said with, you know, recognizing that most planners are probably doing some sort of modular planning anyway. It, it Already twice you've said, you know, these things that I think advisors will say, if you say what type of planning do they go, you know, we do comprehensive financial planning for all of our clients. It's the same service model over and over. We only work with million and up. And then whenever you actually look at the data, which we've done and, and kind of looked at who are advisors really serving? The truth is most advisors don't have million dollar minimums. They say they do, but they've worked, they're working with tons of clients that don't have a million dollars. Their average isn't even close to a million dollars. And so in many ways, it's just finally taking a step back and admitting what we're doing, admitting that, okay, we're not really only working with million and up and we'd really rather work with some smaller clients and help people that, that haven't quite quote unquote made it yet. Uh, and need our help and and figuring out a service model, figuring out a fee structure, the infrastructure, all of that to actually help these clients instead of kind of turning a blind eye to it. Because I think a lot of advisors wake up one day and realize their business isn't anything like what they think it is because they've just allowed it to go on too long without actually addressing it and fixing it. Yeah, no, I think that's uh, I think that's very apt. And it's interesting where you say that most people don't even have that average million dollar client size. When I look at our average, it's, it's somewhere around a million, uh, hmm. even though we have all these tiny clients. Honestly, I think because of our ability to serve clients at any wealth level, but not any, I suppose, we don't really serve billionaires, but those, it actually, I think, has helped us increase our attractiveness to the large clients. Oh, that's an interesting point. most people think the opposite. Uh, yeah. Most people think that, wow, the, the rich people are going to think you're not for rich people, that you know, they are going to go to someone who's a little bit more elite, a little bit more fancy. And maybe it's unique to us because our, our vibe is very yoga, hippie, Buddhist kind of thing sometimes. And so the, the rich people who are, who are attracted to that don't think of themselves as wealthy or say it a different way. They don't like to think of themselves as wealthy, even mm-hmm. though they are. That they're more, they want to save the world. They want to they wanna help people. And so we say, yeah, we can help your whole family. I don't care how much wealth they have. They're like, wow, that's cool. Yeah, I'm working with you. Now, I'm sure there are people who don't want to work with us because we're not elite and don't take them to Laker games or whatever, but that's okay. And nor would you want to work with those clients anyway. No. Uh, yeah. A dilution of brand is certainly a concern for a lot of larger firms that feel they have a brand or a persona for that in, in that elitist category that they work with rich people and they're afraid that if they start working with smaller clients, then suddenly it's going to take away from, from their brand. And like I said, it could be somewhat in your niche market, but also, you know, the majority of millionaires in this country are self-made. 
I mean, that, that's yeah. just a fact. And so I don't know that all of them are looking to stomp on the little guy. I don't know that they're all looking <laughs> to just be like, oh, I'm rich. So I'm only, only going to hang out with the rich people because they didn't necessarily start there. Yeah. Uh, so it's an interesting point. I, I hadn't really considered that it actually could. I've always said it doesn't take away from your brand. You're saying it could even potentially help it and benefit well, it, it because it definitely adds to our brand. I mean, we 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 shout that from the rooftops. It's part of what we talk about. It's who we are. And, and so it's a big piece of our brand. Um, it's not that we're running away from it or hiding it. And I'm not saying that we didn't have these conversations and we don't have half of our uh, partners who are like, yeah, this is, this is scary. We're going to dilute our brand. And we're like, no, this is our brand. <laughs> this is what we want. And this is who we are. And I think it helps a lot. People love it. So let's talk a little bit about the, the fee structure. So previously had those million dollar minimums kind of one I, i'm assuming one percent aum or somewhere in that range yeah one percent on the first three million so we okay. actually raised our fees at one point to just be the flat one percent which honestly people were happy with just so they don't have to do math <laughs> instead of trying to figure out what 90 basis points on the fourth million actually totally. equates yep. to so um, the only people who aren't paying one percent are people who have more than three million dollars and those people are fine in general kind of really sussing out the costs and understanding the fee structure. Yeah, they they can do the math with some little Excel widget that you've probably built. So you you were at 1 million, or I'm sorry, uh, the million dollar minimum, 1% AUM. What is the current, now you said a lot of your clients haven't been shifted over, but for a new client that's coming in, what is their fee structure if they're at zero in assets, you know, a million in assets or 10 million in assets? How does that work at Abacus? So the assets we bill still the same fee structure, 1% on the first 3 million. And we uh, don't vary from that, except in very odd cases where we might offer a discount. That's almost always with you know existing clients. But new clients, I haven't approved a discount in years. Uh, so it's 1% on the first 3 million with no real minimums. So you can come in and open up a $5,000 IRA and we'll take you. If you want to only use us for investments, we'd charge you a minimum 150 bucks per year per account or 120. It's 10 bucks a month per account. Which is probably what your performance reporter is charging you. <laughs> uh, about double that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so that not a big money maker. So it, you're, yeah, you're it's just not even cover- covering costs. Yeah. So we, we do that, but we only charge that $150 minimum if they're not paying us for planning. And so for planning, for people who are paying us for planning, which it's, it's okay still for us to take on clients that are only investments. We're willing to take them on. It's not our preference, and we always push them to take advantage of our planning services, but we'll, we'll still take on a client who's, uh, who only wants us to help investments. But we do insist that they do a two-hour planning session up front, which we usually charge $600 for. Do you find that a lot of clients move from investment only to kind of full financial planning, or, or if they come in for investment only, do they kind of stay there throughout the relationship? That's a great question. I don't know if I have enough data points to to really give you an answer on that. Because as we've rolled out this service over the last two years, we've focused almost exclusively on new clients. And we have not really offered this up to our existing clients yet. But that's our big mission for 2016. So I'll let you know uh, what enough. that version rate is. I think we're aiming for this year to, to bring on, I think, 200 of our probably 800 clients that don't have planning now. So, okay. So you said you have a, a $600 two hour planning session and then and that's, that's kind of worst case scenario. If they, okay. if they just say, look, I don't need financial planning. We're like, okay, but we can't help you with investments unless we understand your life enough to, uh, to figure out your allocation, to figure out if you have any, you know, major issues. So we have kind of an emergency checklist that they run through and it, asks if they have health insurance and auto insurance and do they have kids, do they have a will, you know, just kind of highlight anything. And then what we'll do at the end of that is just give them the list of, okay, well, here are the 10 things that you need to go do. And it's on them. And we're not going to check up and we're not going to ask them if they did it, but they'll, at least we know we've, you know, kind of inoculated them against the worst problems they, they have in their life currently. But what we really push for is for them to take advantage of the ongoing financial planning service. And for that, we charge a monthly retainer fee. And we figure out what that monthly retainer fee is going to be based on what services they actually need. 
So we'll go through all the different financial planning categories in that first meeting with the client, figure out, okay, here's all the stuff that you're going to ultimately need us to do and how quickly, which is a key point, how quickly. And we figure out how much we need to charge them to have a profitable relationship with that client. And that ranges generally from two to 600 bucks a month. So two to 600, so 2,400 to 7,200 a year. So... And it, it could be more than that. We that was have, to say, some we could have be higher. wealthy clients who have a lot of business assets, a lot of real estate assets. They don't want us to manage their money, um, but they want us to be their financial planner. And so we generally charge them roughly what, we, what a normal advisor would charge them. So they come in and they have a $5 million net worth. We may charge them 40000 a year as a retainer. And, not, and does that include investment management or investment management would still be separate? So essentially things get a little fuzzy when we get into the, you know, greater than a million crowd. Okay. So once we get to greater than a million, we essentially start waiving, we just waive that financial planning fee. So once you're paying us 10,000 in fees, we're not going to charge you any more financial planning. We'll just throw the financial planning in. We assume that it's going to cover. Now there are odd occasions where we might charge more than our 1% fee for someone with three or $4 million. Uh, if they have a lot of outside assets or need significant help with those outside assets, maybe it's business or real estate typically that we come in and we're, we're really actively helping them on those portfolios. We'll charge an additional retainer on top of the AUM fee. But for 99% of them, we don't. We'll just charge the asset fee and, and kind of waive the planning fee. And I expect that to reverse at some point. I expect in the future, we will charge the planning fee, but reduce the asset management fee. Oh, man. Talk about picking a fight with the industry right there. <laughs> well, I, and that's why I say it's in the future. And I don't really want to go against what clients are comfortable with. Sure. And what we'll probably do at some point is offer them the choice. You know, pay us 10000 a year flat plus, plus 50 basis points or pay us 1%. And, and it kind of ends up being the same fee one way or the other, and they can pick how they pay it. And then ultimately, as more and more people are picking the retainer plus AUM, then we would switch over to that for everybody. Okay, so... And that would so, be a neutral kind of thing. I'm just right. taking and making it a flat fee instead. And I think the whole industry will be going that way, I expect. And so I'm just kind of waiting, and I want to ride the first wave but not necessarily a be so far out in front that everyone laughs at me. Yeah, and I, I'm totally in agreement with you that AUM essentially will start to fade a little bit. It's a great business model, but as the robos come onto the scene and as we have more advisors serving clients in different ways, I, I do think there, there's going to start to be this push towards more retainer fees. And also, I mean, hey, let's... Uh, I don't know. It hasn't been that long ago that we experienced 2008 and watched half of our revenue disappear overnight yeah. over something we couldn't control. Yeah, I love flat fees. They're the bonds of our uh, <laughs> revenue portfolio. That's a good way to put it. Uh, that's how we think of it. Uh, so as of today, let me just see if I could summarize this. So if you come in over a million, you're going to pay 1% AUM, kind of standard. If you're under a million, you're going to pay a retainer fee for planning plus yep. AUM for yep. investment management, assuming that you want both services. Yep. That planning fee will be anywhere from 200 to 600 a month plus 1% AUM. And as that client grows over time, and maybe they get more complex as, as their assets are growing, maybe that monthly fee is shifting a little bit depending on complexity. But ultimately, eventually that fee is going to hit $10,000 yep. a year. And when it does, they kind of cross into this, okay, we're just going to basically hit that 1% AUM and kind of stick there. Yeah. And it's actually a really, there's a hidden benefit to this kind of pricing. And it's why we kept it, even though it's a little bit complicated and confusing for the people in that kind of 700,000 to million range. And they get a little, it's a weird system. And because what happens is if you do the math, right, you have someone with 800,000 and then we charge them 200 bucks a month, they're already at 10,000. So what we do in that case, we put them at a $10,000 minimum fee. And we say that fee includes your first million dollars of investment management as well as all your planning. And what that does, if they have 800,000, but they might have some assets somewhere else, it's a great incentive to bring over assets because the next 200,000 of investment management is free. Interesting. So it kind of gives them this kind of, you're already paying for it, you might as well move the assets over incentive. Yep. And it, it's great for them. And it's great for us because they start bringing assets over and those assets are going to grow. And so ultimately they then get over a million and then you end up being able to increase the size of that relationship. 
So if listeners want to think, you can go back to, let's see, episode 23 and 24. So xyplanetwork.com slash 23 or slash 24. And episode 23 was Michael Kitsis and I talking about kind of how monthly retainers work. And then episode 24 was about how to integrate it with AUM. And it's kind of funny because it's exactly what we're talking about today is, you know, charging separate fees for separate services. Mm. Now, obviously, at a million, you're you're combining them, which I, I think is, again, the industry norm. It's what most of those clients at that wealth level know. I'd argue somebody that's in your $200 a month retainer category doesn't understand AUM pricing. But if they have $2 million in assets, AUM is what they've known because they've probably worked with other advisors. Yep. So it's kind of standard to them, even though AUM is such a foreign concept to people that have never worked with an advisor before. There's also some, uh, some studies out there that I've looked at, that one in particular, that talked about people's preference for pricing. And what it found, this study, and I'd have to look it up to find it, it pointed to the fact that people who have relatively few assets prefer a la carte pricing. And people who have significant wealth prefer fee-inclusive pricing, but they don't want to feel nickel and dimed. Oh, very interesting. And so we kind of went with that. And, and it, it seems to be anecdotally true from my experience. And I think being able to point to a study or two is always helpful. Makes sense. So with those smaller clients that are coming in, what type of plan? Well, actually, let's start with who's doing the planning. So your firm kind of has a unique firm structure. So it might help to just explain how kind of your team, your advisory teams work. So it makes more sense in terms of who's actually doing the planning work for these smaller asset clients. Well, it's, it, it's, it's interesting because we talked a little bit before about how we merged our two firms together so that everything was in one as opposed to having this firm within a firm structure that I know uh, you mentioned earlier. And moving into this Diamond Team structure, which you could probably have a whole show on Diamond Team, so I don't want to spend too much time on it. But all of our, all of our advisors are on a team with differently experienced people. And so on that team, you'll have someone who's good at sales, someone who's really great with the larger clients, someone who's fine with smaller clients and the trainee position. And we try and get our teams to be as varied as possible from an experience level standpoint, but similar from a, a perspective. So sure. People so they get along. Similar, not just get along, but so that all the people on that team kind of have the same kind of clients they work with. So we might have one team that's very focused on those really engineer type clients and another team that's very focused on the, the innocent type clients who aren't sure or anything and they never want to talk about investments and they just want to be their handheld and they might cry a lot. We try and group our advisors in like style, but different experiences. Because what we noticed when we had the two separate firms with the two separate advisor populations one focused on small clients in terms of assets and the other focused on the, the large complex clients and planning clients is every advisor brings on clients at, at times. Even our new, brand new advisors can bring on some clients. And those clients aren't necessarily the best client for those advisors. And when you have an advisor who's supposed to be focusing on small clients who has a particular service model, and they are, they're going to bring that client on for themselves um, because unless you you know have a lot of breaks in there, if they're not getting to keep it themselves, they're not motivated to bring the client on. So they're not going to bring someone on to pass it off, right? Your firm founders might do that, or your experienced people in your firm might do that, but your new people probably aren't going to do that. In my experience, and so what happens is you get these big complex clients that are being underserved by your inexperienced advisors. And then on the other side, you'll get your experienced advisors who are have 20 years of experience and they'll get a referral from a CPA or one of their clients to someone who has $200,000 and a really simple financial life. And that person will take on that person who's probably paying you $2,000 or $2,500 per year in fees and wasting their time on this client that anyone could handle, that these new advisors could totally handle on their own. And so you, you build in, when you have these separate populations, you build in these inefficiencies. 
And then you have situations where you have small clients who become big clients or big clients who become small clients <laughs> on, the, <laughs> on, the, on the worst side. We've seen it all. And when that happens, you need to have an upgrade path for those clients and you're not going to be able to take it from one advisor and pass it to another advisor who they don't really have a strong relationship with. We tried that for years and it just doesn't happen. They fight it. And, you know, at the end of the day, I'm the boss, right? And I get to tell people what to do and they get to decide whether or not they're going to do it. <laughs> for sure. It no, is, that makes right? sense. You can have mutiny and they're just going to do it their way and they'll delay and they'll say, okay, yeah, we'll get to that and it won't happen. And then you'll ask them again. And then you have a power struggle and trying to get your kind of artificial boundaries created and consistent when the artificial boundaries probably shouldn't have been there in the first place. And so that's why we now have mixed teams. And what I counsel all of my advisors to do is everyone is willing and ready to take on a client at any level of wealth. Now, they may not tend to take on small clients, or they may not really be able to handle large clients. But we don't have, for most of our advisors, there's a few exceptions, but for most of our advisors, we really don't have minimums. That if they have a client who they really love working with, and there's some reason that they think they should work with that client, that we don't have any rules in place for who can work with what clients. So it's basically, I mean, it's just a different mindset. I mean, it's just kind of a different culture of, of what you're trying to build. And again, I, I can't wait to hear Kitsis' view on this because I know it's completely different from yours. And now you've been through it in practice. So sometimes it's the argue between theory and, and practical application that we all love to get into. But it, it's a really interesting point because I, I might argue that you know, it would be good to have a team dedicated to smaller clients because their their needs are unique, especially if we're talking about younger clients because you need the student loan experts, not the social security experts. Right. And then eventually you can hand them off or with a rapidly growing firm like yours, could you have a team dedicated to these smaller clients and they just cap out at X number, however many clients a, a diamond team can hold and then they grow with those clients and then you form a new team. So there's probably a lot of ways to do it, but- yeah, well, but you've iterated, so. Here's what I'll tell you is that I think Michael and I are both right. That I don't think an existing firm can create what Abacus is creating from scratch. And I don't think a firm who has a mature number of clients at this size, so, you know, call it 300 clients, they're going to hit the point where all of the things I described will start happening because mm -hmm. it won't happen at the beginning. It happens later. It happens as your advisors get more experienced, right? You need, sure. you need to build in your upgrade path. And whatever that is, and your upgrade path needs to be true for your clients and your advisors. Because your advisors are ultimately going to be working, most of them, not certainly not all, but your advisors tend to want to start working with more and more complex clients in complex situations. And you don't want to have to move all of their clients to someone else and then start rebuilding that person, right? That makes sense. And so you got to, starting as a firm within a firm, even separately branded, although that one I could argue till, <laughs> until the cows come home, sure. separately branding at firms our size is crazy. You're building two brands instead of one. We don't even have enough money to build one brand, <laughs> um, <laughs> let alone two. But, you know, we had ours, our two brands were like Abacus Wealth Partners and Abacus Portfolios. So it was the same brand, but slightly different names. And that was fine. And I think it really helped us grow in the beginning. It's just that ultimately, there are problems with that. And so anyone who's doing it that way, which I think is a great riskless way to start and see if it works for your firm, you need to start thinking from the beginning, okay, so how do I get out of this? Mm. right? How do I deal with the fact that this 25-year-old that I just hired who's going to work with 25 and 30-year-olds, what happens in 5, 10 years when that person's 30 and his clients are 30 to 35 and they now have way more money, but only half of them do because not everyone pops? It's a tricky solution and I don't know that there's a way around just going through the pain of growing. <laughs> it's part of it and that's okay. 
Makes sense. And this is one of the advantages, you know, you mentioned the diamond team structure, which is uh, for anybody that's not familiar, it's uh, kind of the brainchild of Angie Herbers, who is now one of the co-founders of Kaleido out of San Diego, but it's basically a structure of of advisors in these kind of different teams, which is kind of what you're building here. Yeah. And so the key here for us, especially with these small clients, is that mixed experience level on teams. And it's really that part is what allows us to to handle these these smaller clients. Makes sense. And and I'm familiar with one of your teams, even, you know, one of the advisors work works virtually and the other members of that team don't work virtually. So, I mean, it's it's each team is incredibly varied and yet has a very core personality to it, I think. Yeah, oh yeah, we let them name themselves and we don't publish the names so the names get a little weird. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you what any of them are here, but uh they have fun with it. Let me just put it that way. Hey, fair enough. If that's what builds the community. so And it uh, allows for fun competition, right? When you play dodgeball, then you can, you know, team up with your team. And, you know, some teams win because of that. And some <laughs> teams, um, but, um, but they all have friendly competitions between each team. And sometimes your teams are geographic and sometimes they're not. Makes sense. Now, we have clients all over the country. And we have offices in two states, not 40. But we have clients in 40 states. And... So trying to do this all, part of the push for us in working with these smaller clients is because I mentioned the books, both of our founders have written. So we get a lot of people who call us and say, hey, I read this book. It was really interesting. And we realized that maybe half a percent of the people who contacted us could qualify to work with us. Mm. That was another real push for us to create a service for these you know, thousands of people that are contacting us who can't help. It's like, oh, there's clearly a market here. Right? We just need to figure out how to price it and how to deliver it. Well, and that's kind of always been my push with advisors is they say, you know, we can't work with those clients because they're not profitable. That's not a client problem. That's an advisory firm problem. If you well, can't, more specifically, it's a pricing problem. Exactly. And one that's easily fixed. I mean, in reality, we're one of the few industries, I think, that is just so freaking stuck in the way that we charge that we just can't get out of it enough to actually roll out these new you know, service models and pricing structures in order to accommodate, like I said, the ocean, the, the just wide open ocean of, of clients that ultimately are not being served by the advisory community and yet really, really want to be. I think mm-hmm. there's just a massive marketplace, which is why I think we're seeing the growth with an XY planning network is because we're seeing, you know, once advisors get started and say, hey, I want to work with younger clients that don't necessarily have assets, they're getting flooded with young clients that don't have assets because those young clients that don't have assets aren't really being, you know, courted by any other advisors. Yeah, nobody wants them. I figured I'm going to create a great business by doing everything that everyone else says is stupid. <laughs> <laughs> well, we you're picking a lot of fights, which I love, of course, because we're doing that inside of XY Planning Network. And we didn't, you know, I guess for listeners out there, JD and I actually met at T3 back in 2015, I guess. But we had had a conversation right around the launch of XYPN in April 14, because you were kind of rolling this out, thinking you were the only one that was having this thought. And yeah, we exactly. were launching. I rolled it out January of 14, and then I see your press release. I'm like, oh, man. <laughs> There's others. And we felt the same way. We're like, oh, we have this new idea that no one else is doing. And of course, there are other people having this idea. But again, it's picking a lot of fights. And we're saying, hey, we can work virtually. We can work with younger clients. We can work with clients that don't have assets. We can charge monthly, not just AUM. We can launch firms for less than $10,000. And so it's something I enjoy is that we get to pick a lot of fights. And you're picking a lot of fights all at once, not just in you know, some of the things we're talking about, but also with, with social impact investing and picking the fight to say, hey, I think we can get similar returns without sacrificing, you know, our client's morality in their opinion. You know, Absolutely. we can work with younger clients inside of a billion dollar firm. We don't have to just keep raising our minimums because that's what everybody else does. So I obviously yeah. love it. That is the purpose of our firm is to expand what's possible with money, which when you're expanding what's possible, it means you're picking fights. And people will get really offended. Now, I would encourage listeners, if you're getting offended, just know that this is one way to do it. You know, this is this is the <laughs> abacus way to do it. And sometimes I think people feel attacked whenever we try to shake things up and ruffle some feathers. And, and I'm not going to say that the way everybody's doing is necessarily wrong. What I get annoyed with is when people say, I really want to serve younger clients and I can't because they're not profitable. That is incorrect. If you say, I don't want to serve younger clients because I don't like working with people with student loans, totally fine. You know, yeah. if you like working with self made millionaires, go work with self made millionaires. I'm good with it. You know, we'll take care of the rest of the clients. Yeah. I may not do everything, but don't tell me I can't. <laughs> 
<laughs> and if I'm offending you, you can reach me on Twitter at JD Bruce CPA. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'll be you all day long. My uh, my mentor in college told me that he knew I would be successful one day because the only thing that drove me was people telling me I couldn't do things. And so uh, that has certainly played out a little bit anyway. So two things I want to hit on as we're kind of wrapping up. One, I want to circle back to service model. And then I want to close out with a discussion, kind of making some recommendations for folks that are trying to do this inside of a firm and aren't necessarily the president of the firm, which I don't guess we touched on earlier, but JD is the president of Abacus, meaning he gets to do what he wants, assuming the board doesn't fire him in the process. <laughs> so it's a little different. So we'll, we'll sort of like that. But going back to service model, you said something really interesting around modularizing financial planning and that that allows you to kind of have a basis of complexity. Because I think a lot of people base complexity of planning, especially if they're doing project-based planning on assets and they just say income and assets, which you know is certainly one gauge of complexity. But can you talk a little bit about your modules? So you said, you know, if you need really intense estate planning versus really basic, I mean, how does that work? How are you managing that for 12 to 1400 clients? Uh, that's a great question. And a lot of that's just on the advisor. And I think it's not all that different from your typical service model. Your advisors know what a client needs and so they deliver it. The tricky part is figuring out, it's figuring out in advance what the client needs and instead of just being reactive um, and then setting the expectations. So a lot of firms have solved this and I've seen really cool stuff that firms have done in terms of going through with the client, going through anything they might be able to do, check off the things that they do need to do schedule those things out throughout the year, and then deliver on that. And some of these firms are really amazing at getting all this stuff organized and scheduled. I think we're getting there in terms of being really great and organized around this stuff. But firms like the Foster Group and Willow Creek and, and Sebastopol, they've created some great stuff that I've seen that really shows me, uh, wow, this is you guys have it down. Every client is getting the same service every year. And a lot of my study groups, that's all we're talking about. And that's regardless of large or small clients an mm. issue. So what we're doing now, because like I said, this is a pricing problem, not a service problem, because the reality is that every financial planner I ever met, when their client calls and asks a question, they don't say, well, that's really outside the scope of our relationship. I've never heard a financial no, planner they just do it. suggest saying that they do it. And they do it for free, essentially, because it's not priced into their, to their model. And the clients with $4 million bucks who are paying you, you know, whatever, 40000 30 grand a year, they're fine, right? Those are profitable enough clients that you wing it and you're fine. You can't wing it on the small clients because complexity does not equal wealth. I've had plenty of tiny clients in terms of assets who have the complexity of, of a client who has $10 bucks, And I've had clients with $10 bucks who have no complexity. Mm. They got 10 million bucks sitting in one account. You're like, they just say, just send me a couple hundred grand a year and I'm good. <laughs> and, and there's no planning, right? <laughs> then wait, what's the planning? They're good. There's no, they're never going to run out of money. Maybe there's some estate stuff, you know, but they're easy. I know, like, I know ah, advisors, I, all the charity, right? I know advisors are thinking, how do I find 10 of those? Cause that's a heck of a lifestyle. <laughs> You know, kind of, but, you know, we provide value. And so sure. those clients, you really need to charge less. That's fair. Because you're overcharging them. And what's happened in the past is that simple clients are subsidizing complex clients. Hmm. And that's what we're ultimately trying to change is that we want to charge each client, not on an hourly basis, because that's just has its own problems, but really charge them a portion of the value we're creating for them. And so what we've done is we've figured out our cost to deliver a whole bunch of different planning stuff, right? We'd say, okay, how long does it take us to really do a basic estate plan? Just kind of the legal Zoom, simple living trust. So if they have more than 5 million bucks and we need an estate attorney or, or for whatever reason we need an estate attorney, how much time does that take? Okay, how long do we deal with CPAs? How long do we deal with CPAs if the client needs their hand held? How long do we, does it take to get an insurance review? How long does it take to get an insurance review if the client needs us to do all the work versus them doing it themselves? And so we have this spreadsheet where you go in and you just check off all the boxes of all the things the client needs and or wants, which aren't always the same thing, mm -hmm. and then schedule each of those things in a particular quarter. So if a client doesn't need everything up front, and can space it out, well, you can charge less because you know that you don't have the risk that that client is going to get all the work done in four months and then leave. And so essentially, you just 
charge a premium for stuff that needs to be done right away and you have a discount for things that need to be done in the future. And ultimately, what you're able to do is figure out, okay, for the first 18 months or two years or so of the time I'm working with this client, what's the total amount of work I'm doing? And you divide that by the time period and figure out the monthly fee so you, so you earn that over those first couple of years. Because you're not doing any sort of, of upfront fee in addition to the monthly fee, correct? We're not. And I think that's a question of scale that for us, we don't need to, to operate. Sure. And so all doing that, charging an upfront fee is great, particularly for people starting out because it, it reduces the risk that you're going to get burned um, by a client. But, you know, we have, we're over 10 million in revenue. I, that extra 600 bucks, if I lose it or a client burns me by leaving too soon and I don't end up earning back all the work I've done, no one's going hungry. So it's fine. Right. Absolutely. And so taking away that barrier to entry for a client who has to write a big upfront check makes it much easier for the client to say yes and allows me to charge a higher monthly fee. And for me, recurring revenue is better than, than one-time revenue. Makes sense. Okay. So that's the way that you're basically ensuring that, I mean, one, that clients are with you at least for the first couple of years because you're kind of scheduling out a, a calendar of of to-dos, but also, you know, it is a way of kind of keeping that fee a little higher because you're going to be do it. Well, I guess in your, I guess you said to keep it a little lower because you're amortizing out the work over several years. Well, I think we're able to charge a higher monthly fee because we don't charge an upfront fee. Mm. That really over the course of two years, we're all going to charge the same amount of money, assuming sure. the client stays around. It's just that ours is higher concentrated in the second year, and someone who charges up front, it's going to be concentrated more in the first year. But at the end of the day, the pricing is going to be about the same. Right. And as a startup, you care about year one revenue. As a, as a large firm, you care a lot more about year five revenue. It totally. Um, and- <laughs> <laughs> right? Like, what does that mean? Like if someone were to buy our firm or we're valuing our firm, which one creates more enterprise value? Mm -hmm. And it's the recurring. And we tell our clients, this isn't, we're not going to create a financial plan for you. And we don't, we don't create financial plans. We are their financial planner. And we have a relationship with the client. And the reason we do that is because by the time you're done with a financial plan, it's probably probably dated anyway, <laughs> because it takes so long. Absolutely. To By the time you did, they probably changed their job and you're just creating a new one. But instead, what we're doing is trying to answer their questions, trying to solve their problems and trying to be that person for them that we know everything about them so that when they're at the car lot deciding whether they should buy or lease and if the interest rate's good, they just call us and we answer the question because it's all there. And so it's a planning relationship, not a transaction. And we tell our clients that I'm going to work with you, your children, and your grandchildren. Well, maybe not me personally, but our firm. And we want your family, we want you, and we want to have you for life. And you've built a way, again, to do that profitably and not be running a charity. I mean, any advisor can say that and and work with the grandkids of clients for free, Yeah, but that's not scalable. And this is a way to actually be able to you know, work with all the prospects that most firms are sending away that don't meet their asset minimums to work with the the kids of clients and engage them in the planning relationship early on. We know that the kids of clients tend to leave their advisor when their parents pass away. And this is a way of kind of mitigating so many of these risks. I think that, that firms are waking up to, they're starting mm-hmm. to, to see that, you know, they're, you know, 60 years old, like the average advisor and their clients average age is 65 or 70. You know, I, I've seen advisory firms that, that thought they were going to grow and they ended up not that year because so many clients passed away because yep. they're just getting older. And so these are the questions that, that people keep asking. Now, for the flip side, and this is a little different again, because you're the boss, you get to bring these ideas to the table and fight for them. We get so many requests from what I'll call the intrapreneurs out there, the folks that are just not comfortable being an entrepreneur. They don't want to go off on their own and start their own firm. They're comfortable with a salary. They love the firm. They love going to the office and, and their clients and all of that. They're For whatever reason, they want to stay at their firm, but they really want to bring some of these concepts to the firm. They want to work with smaller clients. Do you have any tips or recommendations for how to get advise you know the advisor owners the partners on board with this type of concept i mean is it literally just laying out a pnl to say this is how it's going to be profitable or are you finding that there's just resistance that can't be overcome i mean what would you tell those younger advisors uh okay i got a few pieces of advice right first one is just go to abacuswealth.com slash careers <laughs> hey that's a fair point <laughs> 
that, and, and I say that as honestly, you know, finding a firm where you fit and your mission fits uh, is really key. And I will tell you that it took me, you know, as the president and as a leader in this firm, part of that five year process wasn't figuring out how to do it because it's not that big of a problem to solve. And it's not like we solved it with technology. We solved it conceptually. Or I don't know if we solved it, but we're, you know, we approached it conceptually as opposed to with technology. Sure. We didn't build an automated platform. That a lot of that time was spent getting the people who are on our board and our owners comfortable. And a lot every objection you've ever heard was had here, right? It's going to dilute the brand. It's not going to be profitable. We should just be charging up front. Why don't we just do this all pro bono and help all these people for free? Mm. If it's part of our mission, why are we even charging? Why bother? The, is the pricing right? Should we have a separate firm? Should, all those things we talked about and then we figured it out. And then we had to figure it out again. Then we had to figure it out again because the people who we convinced weren't actually convinced. And so it's not easy. Unless you have a champion who owns a significant percentage of the firm, it may not happen. Mm. Right? Because it's, it's not immediately profitable to the extent that large clients are immediately profitable. And you really need to structure your firm in a way that wants significant growth and wants to have a career path and wants to be hiring young advisors and not just one, right? It's not just hire one and then hope it works. It's a consistent hiring and then hiring again and then hiring again and then hiring again. And a lot of it's on faith. And so if it's not part of the firm's mission, like if you just work there and you're a 30-year-old advisor and you want to get the, your firm of 60-year-old owners to start doing this, um... <laughs> All right, well... AdvocateSmall.com hey, that- <laughs> slash that's why Planning Network. Do it yourself. It's tough, right? If you're in a firm where your core values don't match the firm's core values. It's a really fair point that that I think a lot of times whenever these discussions are had that you know, it's like in any relationship, what people are saying is the problem isn't always the actual problem. And so, you know, they'll fight on, oh, well, it won't be profitable. Oh, it'll dilute the brand. But in reality, it's just they don't want to freaking do it, <laughs> you know, or they, you got a bunch of rich guys who are fine. They don't need any more money. Yeah, they're, they're good. Like, honestly, what doing that for, you know, if you have a group of 65 year old owners, they're probably thinking about selling to someone if not to an outsider, at least to insiders, doing this kind of thing will lower margins and theoretically lower valuation. In the short term, for sure. In the short term. Yeah, because you're going to invest. You have to hire people. You, In general, the retainer business is a lower margin than a UM business because it can be, because it doesn't have market risk, which is another great thing. You can have 10% margins on this kind of business and be really happy hmm. because you don't have any sort of movement, right? That 200 bucks a month is going to be 200 bucks a month until you change it. And you don't have to worry about what the market did last week. And so you don't have to keep 30% margins just so you can guarantee 20% margins. That's a really interesting point. So you you can operate at a little bit lower margin simply because you have flat recurring revenue instead of variable revenue you can't control. Again, it's that it's the bond in the revenue portfolio. Yeah, exactly. Because you're adding in bonds, your returns might be a little lower in terms of margin. Your profits will go up. It's not that they're expensive profits, but they're um, different. So as much as I say, it's, you know, we try and keep things similar, adding this in changes your firm fundamentally. And to and your point, you, it requires the culture of the firm to be behind it. If there's only one champion for this at a larger firm, it's never going to get off the ground. It, it takes a long time to get everyone on board. Unless you had a really charismatic champion that can change everyone's mind over five years. Yeah, it'd be good if y'all had had one of those, huh? I know. <laughs> to do it over two years instead of five. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, honestly, it's the growth of XY Planning Network has come from, you know, who I have been frequently calling the pissed off junior planners. And it is the younger advisor in the firm that's, you know, and, and this was me many years ago now, it seems, fighting for this inside of a larger firm. And, and when it doesn't happen, you just go, screw it. I can just do this myself because it would be easier than spending five years to try to change the culture. But... That's for the folks like myself that had a desire to only serve these clients, whereas it was probably helpful for Abacus to have you with this desire to serve all clients I and mean, not necessarily trying to abandon the, the existing model. It's how do we adapt? Yeah, I actually do. Ha- I, I, have, I, I do have an interesting idea for those people who are sitting in because 
like you said, the entrepreneurs who don't want to take the risk, they need their salary. Um, and I've talked to a lot of those people and I feel for them because they want to do something cool, but they can't, they can't afford to, to take the risk. I would guess that a lot of firms would be willing to split the difference and essentially say, look, why don't you stay on, you know, three quarters time, right? And work for us. And in your other quarter of the time, why don't you launch this business? You own it, right? And if it gets to 500,000 in revenue or 100,000 or 200, whatever it is in revenue, then we'll buy it and merge it into our firm. I will admit that sounds amazing on paper. And truth be told, we actually have a lot of folks when they go to launch their own firm, their old owner will call them and go, why don't you do this inside of our firm? Mm -hmm. But we won't pay you kind of an eat what you kill strategy, which is like the worst case scenario across the board. I don't know. I don't know. I'd be interested to know how many firm owners out there would be willing to do that. Because if you gave me 10 firm owners that would do that, I will give them 100 applicants for that job. Oh, I'm Um, sure. Well, there, there you go. For those of you out there with big firms who are listening, honestly, I think it's a great riskless way to launch this. It's more expensive ultimately because, you know, you're going to have to, because you're taking no risk and someone else is, uh, you're, you're going to pay a little bit more to get that launched. But once it gets to 100000 in revenue, so let's say you end up buying that firm for $150,000, $200,000, right? And just create a, a, an agreed upon price at the beginning. So say, hey, you focus on this, right? You take any leads that, you know, and we'll even pass you leads. It's fine. Get it to 100000 150000 200000 at whatever point that the owners feel like it's successful. We'll buy it at that point, roll it into the firm, and then we have an operating, an operating thing that we didn't have to, to do any of the investment in. And then... What they're buying is now an established-ish business that they can then take and scale up, which most of these business owners are probably fairly good at, right? They know how to run a business, sure. but they're not necessarily entrepreneurs anymore, right? They're past that point in their life. So let these other guys do the entrepreneurial work. Maybe the firm takes a 25% ownership in it or something and create it separately. Let that person run with it. I know several firms who have done that, where they've kind of provided the the rent and provided a little bit of salary on the side while they're getting started and that person slowly kind of fades out the firm keeps 25 percent or some percentage of it and the entrepreneur keeps the rest and to your point that's not as risky for the firm and it, it and it's not as risky for the entrepreneur that's trying to do this because instead of quitting your job and trying to do this from scratch and basically having no income for the first couple of years you can still pull a salary you essentially have a full-time you know or or close to a full-time job while you're building this out so and maybe you get a payday you know i mean maybe you build this thing up and you get a couple hundred thousand dollars and in, in a bump in salary and and you're happy because you're doing the work you want to be doing you got a payday but it's not, you know, with risk comes return. So if you want to take, if you want the big payday, you want the big return, you got to go do this on your own. Same for firms. If you want the big, you know, if you want to do this and, and make the most return out of it, do it on your own. But otherwise, that is a, it's an interesting way of, of meeting in the middle. I, I think that, again, I know a lot of younger advisors that would do that. So for any of the larger firms, existing firms that are out there that are looking for that, feel free to join our VIP community at xyplaynetwork.com slash VIP. You post in there something like this, and I, I bet you'll find uh, there are a lot of folks hungry for that type of arrangement. Yeah. So, I mean, if I were doing it, let me see, if someone came to me and said, I want to do this, maybe I'd go 50, 50. Hmm. Um, and I'd say, look, I own 50%. I'll feed you leads. Cause I got plenty of them. Right. So you're going to get a lot of people to talk to. You're going to own 50% of it. It gets to two, 300,000. I value it. And then I'm not going to pay them cash 200,000, but I'm going to give them uh, equity and they become a new partner. So now we have a new partner that didn't have to borrow money to buy in, mm. or they may not have been able to do that. And it's not a stock grant, so it's not taxable because it's, uh, they've created it through sweat equity. So it's a great way to create a sweat equity program for a young planner who has a lot of potential. Oh, man. I wish we had started with that. What an awesome way to end the show. We're going to have to, uh, I'm going to have to say something in the intro and, and all the show notes, be sure to force people to listen to the end of this. <laughs> all the way to the end. If you don't listen to the end, you don't get the candy. That's, that's it. The, uh, it's, 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 that is rich. I love it. I, I've never seen a white paper on that one. Yeah, I, I think we're going to start fighting over who, who gets to steal that idea. You heard it on XYPN radio. So, we actually did. Uh, that was when I, when we created that separate firm, it had a little bit of a differential ownership. Hmm. So we had two or three of the people who only owned equity in that, in that firm. And so when we merged the firms together, two or three people ended up with a small amount of equity in the total thing that they 
were able to kind of earn their way up to. I was one of them. I, I ended up becoming a partner in, in Abacus as a whole because I owned a small piece of that other company. Very cool. And these so are the things the, the financial planning industry has just been so resistant to. And I think that these are the things that, especially as younger advisors are coming up and they're seeing these stories and they're, they're listening to this show or they're hearing like, oh, this can be done. These are stories that don't get out very easily because you know, you're busy running your firm. You're not busy trying to tell other people all the, the nuances of how all this has been done. But as these stories get out, I think it'll be interesting to see how change is forced uh, because you know, I, I, continuing to do things the way they've always been done, I, it's just not sustainable. It's not going to continue to work. Yeah, well, that's why it helps that I didn't come from the wealth management industry. I came completely from outside, so I didn't have any preconceived notions of what was okay. So fortunate. <laughs> and and it is a, it's a struggle. I mean, for young planners that are coming up, for college students, I mean, I feel for them because they are very idealistic in what they believe we do. And then they show up and, and realize that what we hold ourselves out as doing and what we actually do can be very different. There's a select few firms that I think are very authentic in the way that they operate. And, and Abacus certainly would be on that short list. But JD, thank you so much for taking the time to be on today. This was so helpful. And I'm excited to see all the questions that we get off of this show, because I bet there's going to be a bunch of them. Well, I'm happy to answer them. So thank you for having me on. I really appreciate it. So for anyone out there that is looking to build a service offering to work with clients that don't have a million dollars in AUM, I really hope this interview is helpful. JD has done some awesome work at Abacus, but I think it's important to point out that it's taken him five years to do so. So it was certainly not a short or easy road, but definitely worthwhile. Remember that if you want to ask him any questions, you can do so in our VIP community, which is free to join at xyplanningnetwork.com slash VIP. And remember that you can access the show notes and any additional resources that we mentioned on the show at xyplanningnetwork.com slash 32. This month's shows are brought to you by Wealthbox CRM, a technology partner of the XY Planning Network. XYPN actually provides Wealthbox CRM for free to all of its members. Wealthbox CRM is simple, beautiful, and a collaborative CRM for the modern financial advisor. You can start a free trial in 30 seconds at wealthbox.com. And also be sure to check out our interview with the co-founders of Wealthbox CRM, John Rourke and Dan Ferranti. Thanks so much for joining me today. We'll see you next time. You're not alone and you're not crazy. It's scary starting, building, and growing your own financial planning firm. And that's why we put together a free private community just for you, the Cutting Edge Financial Planner. Go to xyplanningnetwork.com slash VIP or text XYPN Radio to 333 333- and join a network of thousands ready to change the lives of Gen X and Gen Y clients. 